So the uh, first speaker this afternoon will be, uh, I think we could say it, El Jefe, Dr. David Notrica, uh, who will be uh, talking about uh, pancreatic injuries in children. Uh, David's a native of Atlanta, Georgia, and graduated uh, cum laude from Duke University and then went on to Emory for his medical school uh, and did his general surgery residency there as well, so hence the ties to Dr. Feliciano, and went on to do his pediatric surgery fellowship at Baylor, ties to Dr. Maddox, uh, at the Texas Children in Houston. He's now, he has a whole host of accomplishments and awards, uh, and is currently in the University of Arizona uh, in Phoenix. Um, he is a, a co-chair of the Southwest Trauma and Acute Care uh, Symposium, the Western Pediatric Trauma Conference, Trauma Conference International here, he's the chair of, and uh, the Advanced Pectus Course. He's past president of the Arizona Trauma Association at the Phoenix Children's Hospital. He's been chairman of surgery and served on the hospital board of directors uh, from 2005 to 2008. And it's a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Notrika here today to talk about the real deal pediatric pancreatic injuries. Well, thanks everybody. I really appreciate everyone being here. I'm gonna talk to you um, uh, today about uh, something a little different. We're gonna talk about the truth about uh, pan pediatric pancreatic trauma. And so um, as pediatric surgeons, we were taught that children's organs sh shouldn't be touched. So um, this, that was the beginning of the Respect the Spleen movement, which I know a lot of you guys are members of. We as pediatric surgeons think of ourselves as the guardians of children's organs. And only forces of evil would take out spleens. So the same must be true of the pancreas, right? Well, truth number one, the pancreas is not the spleen. So the spleen can be contused, lacerated, lightsabered, um, and, but the pancreas can actually be injured in four ways. It can be bruised and contused and lacerated, but it can also have a duct that's partially injured or transected, or a duct that is completely transected. And in patients who have duct injuries, they are prone to pancreatic uh, enzyme leaks. They're, they can get pancreatic pseudocysts. They can undergo autolysis or autolysis of the pancreas itself as it digests not just the fat around it, which is saponification, but actually the pancreas itself. When, uh, when the spleen is injured, it doesn't really matter that much where the spleen's injured. Maybe the hilum is a little different than, than the rest, but for the most part, the spleen you know, you injure it, you injure it. But in pancreatic trauma, location matters tremendously. Um, for those of you um, who aren't familiar with grading, a grade one uh, injury um, is shown here. It's a, a, it's a laceration that goes into the parenchyma without any loss. Grade two injury is uh, obviously a little bit more um, significant um, uh, injury, uh, but again, the duct is intact. Um, grade three injuries um, are those injuries that have uh, involvement of the pancreatic duct itself. Grade four injuries are injuries to the head of the pancreas. And grade five injuries are injuries that uh, completely disrupt the head of the pancreas. So how good is CT at even identifying and grading the pancreatic injury? So you have to realize that even though we think it's pretty good, if you really look at the numbers, and this is a multi-center uh, trial, um, a double AST study that was published in 2009 using a 64-channel CT scan, the sensitivity for pancreatic injury was only 47%. And um, when it comes to pancreatic duct injury, the sensitivity for picking up injuries to the main pancreatic duct was only about 52%. Surprisingly, if they do see a duct transection, it's about 90% specific. And in CT scanning, the dark areas that you, of the pancreas can represent lacerations, hematomas, contusions, or simply fluid. And the duct, despite the arrow pointing to it, is not clearly seen on CT scan. And so truths number three and four are the pancreatic duct isn't seen on CT, and CT scanning is as good as a, at identifying the status of the pancreatic duct as a coin flip. 
Um, so imaging to, to, to fully assess the pancreas involves um, an MRCP or an ERCP if you really want to be able to grade a pancreatic injury. And the CT may be wrong 10 to 40 percent of the time. So the truth, is, the, the question is, can, can some pancreatic injuries be managed non-operatively with good outcomes? And I think we all know that the answer to this, which is that the low-grade injuries, the grade one and grade two injuries, um, are very easily managed without surgery. In this study, despite that, um, the, uh, these patients actually had um, uh, operations, and what this, what this showed is that those patients who did have operations, they really didn't do um, much in the way of, of manipulating the pancreas. So a lot of these were patients who had operations for other reasons, and they didn't have a pancreatic uh, procedure. And those patients do well, the ones and twos. They may have complications, but they don't need surgery in order to heal. So truth three is that minor, minor pancreatic injuries can be managed non-operatively. Can pancreatic injuries that involve the main pancreatic duct undergo successful uh, non-operative management? So um, Dr. Ono in 1995 reported the first uh, pediatric series of a complete disruption of the main pancreatic duct. And it was a case that was successfully managed by percutaneous drainage. And it was really the first reported case. It was a seven-year-old uh, that had a bicycle handlebar injury. They developed a pancreatic pseudocyst, underwent external drainage. And uh, what you see here are the images that are from that article. They did a fistogram that showed a complete disruption of the main pancreatic duct. They did percutaneous uh, drainage and it resolved in about 100 days. And what they concluded is that complete disruption of the duct can be successfully managed percutaneously. Here's the problem. This is the image from that. And this is not what a transected pancreatic duct looks like. There's no contrast extravasation. And this is probably a pseudocyst compressing the duct. And um, this is compared to a, a picture that I took um, a few months ago that shows an ERCP. And in this study, and unfortunately I can't point to it, but basically there's a line um, that shows the duct and then there's a bunch of black stuff um, that is actually the, the contrast extravasation. And that's what a pancreatic duct injury looks like. So following on the, foot, on the uh, footsteps, um, Kochi um, looked in 1999 at five children who actually had main pancreatic duct injuries, and all five developed pseudocysts. Two of them ruptured their pseudocyst, and two of them required operation. The mean hospitalization was about two months, and one died of sepsis while on TPN. And what they concluded is that non-operative management of pancreatic injuries is effective in children. I'm not sure I would have made the same conclusion. Um, this is a look at the literature um, uh, you know, and the, the pediatric pancreatic studies um, that have been published. And, and the, the red dot is that case report by UNO. And this shows not only the number of cases being reported, but also the number that favor non-operative management. And what you see here is that there is now a, a vast drop in the number of studies that suggest that we should be doing non-operative management. And that, that's dropped to one or two a year now. This study called Is It Worth the Wait looked at 39 grade three pancreatic injuries and they compared the 38 that were managed non-operatively to the 24 that were managed, sorry, the 38 percent that were managed operatively to the 24 percent that were non-operative. And then after controlling for injury severity scale and associated injuries, the non-operative patients actually had, um, had eight times more complications than those that were managed operatively and two additional weeks of TPN. So what about using other therapies um, like ERCP to try and save the pancreas? And um, this is a study that we published uh, last year in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery. And what we showed is that um, it, for grade three injuries, we were able to, to manage a fair number of those injuries non-operatively. And by non-operatively, I mean we did um, ERCP and sphincterotomies. And, um, the, uh, and so there clearly are some cases that, that we can manage um, uh, non-operatively. And the, the truth about those cases is that those that we did choose to manage non-operatively, the duct was injured, but it wasn't tra transected. So we were able to see the distal part of the pancreatic duct, which means there's a duct injury, but the duct itself st still was holding together. And then the other truth, of course, is that if you're going to do that route, 
healing takes a long time. So um, ERCP with sphincterotomy and stenting across the duct also shows some promise. Um, again, the data is very sparse and I can't list that as a, as a true truth. I can say it is a maybe truth. <laughs> so does non-operative management of the pancreas save the pancreas? Well, if you do non if you do non-operative management of the spleen, you save the spleen. But when it comes to the pancreas, we don't know that you get to keep the part of the pancreas distal to where the injury was. And this study by Edwards um, shows an injury, in which I would point to you, but I can't, and, um, and the fact that, uh, every, that all the pancreas beyond that injury has atrophied. Is this common? Well, um, another study, they had 10 uh, consecutive patients. They re-CAT scanned nine of them, and six of the nine patients that they re-imaged that had non-operative management, the tail atrophied. So truth number eight, non-operative management of patients with ductal injury fails to save the pancreas in two-thirds of the cases. Does operation shorten the hospitalization or the complications? Well, there was a nice multicenter pediatric trauma study that was done with 162 patients. 57%, 57 of them underwent distal pancreatectomy and 92% were managed non-operatively and they compared the groups, and they were comparable for injury severity scale and age and the need for ICU. But the distal pancreatectomy group was quicker to goal feeds by a week, had no pseudocyst, fewer endoscopic procedures, fewer interventional radiology procedures. And so we know that for patients with injuries to the body or the tail of the pancreas, distal pancreatectomy is superior to non-operative management. Can, the distal, um, can distal pancreatectomy be done laparoscopically? Yeah, absolutely. There have been more than seven pap papers now written, and the largest series was about seven cases where they did laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy. Um, we also published a video of that if you want to see how to do it. It's actually much easier than you think. If you can do uh, advanced laparoscopic surgery, you can definitely do a, a distal pancreatectomy for pancreatic trauma, especially if they come in early. So, when you compare the, the, uh, the two groups, um, uh, open versus laparoscopic, you find that the, that the operative time is about the same for both groups, but the length of stay is only about six days for laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy versus about 11 days for open. And the morbidity was not different between the two groups either. So the real question if you're gonna advocate for distal pancreatectomy is, um, do those patients get diabetes later in life? And if you look at children who have less than 50% of their pancreas resected, they don't have abnormal glucose tolerance testing. But if they have more than two-thirds of their pancreas resected, even though they're not diabetic, they will have abnormalities on glucose tolerance testing. Well, what happens when they're adults? Well, we know that if you look at older patients, adult patients who have distal pancreatectomies, less than 8% of those patients in long-term follow-up will develop diabetes later. And the most common uh, association with, with that are those that actually had cr chronic pancreatitis as the reason for having their pancreas taken out or operated on. So, so what are our options for saving the pancreas? Well, non-operative management doesn't do it and distal pancreatectomy doesn't do it. Are there any other options? Um, Ruin Y pancreatic ojejunostomy is an option to save the distal portion of the pancreas. And this is a study of 10 patients, and what they found is that it was, that it was equivalent to distal pancreatectomy and morbidity. It avoids pancreatic atrophy associated with non-operative management, and it's a good option in cases where greater than 50% greater than of the, of the uh, gland would otherwise uh, be removed. The other um, surgical option is pancreaticogastrostomy. And in this procedure, an opening is made in the back wall of the uh, stomach and the pancreas is sewn into the back of the stomach. This is an image uh, from uh, Hamadan uh, uh, Jarami showing what, uh, what a CT scan looks like after a pancreaticogastrostomy. So truths number 10, 11, 12. Resection of less than half of the pancreas does not result in diabetes and is unlikely to result in diabetes later in life either. Laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy is surgically feasible when the duct injury is diagnosed early and surgical options exist for saving the pancreas.
Now, um, last month in the, in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons, another paper came out. And uh, so I added this on later because it concluded that overall, children managed non-operatively have equivalent or better outcomes when compared to operative and delayed operative management in regards to death, overall complications in ICU. Yeah. The, the problem with this study is that they didn't separate out, the, uh, separate out the patients with duct injuries and without duct injuries. And they assigned the patients who failed non-operative management or had late surgery to the operative group. So what they've done is they've taken all of the non-operative failures and moved them over into the other group for the analysis. So uh, truth number 14, uh, beware of large database studies on pancreatic trauma. And uh, this really has to do with a technical problem where um, it, they don't grade the in injuries in the National Trauma Database. They use um, AIS or abbreviated injury scale. And so they lump together those with duct injuries and those without duct injuries. So. The truth, in summary, pancreas is not the spleen, pancreatic duct is not seen on CT scanning, and CT scanning misses some injuries. Non-operative management of the main pancreatic duct is possible, but it takes a long time to heal. After a week, the abdomen looks like this. Non-operative management uh, of the pancreas fails to save the distal pancreas in two-thirds of the cases. Distal pancreatectomy does not lead to diabetes uh, later in life. Laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy is surgically feasible when the duct injury is diagnosed early. Reconstructive surgery is an option and results in pancreatic salvage. And number nine, the data is poor. So uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, for those online, there in the top right-hand corner of your screen, there's a question mark. So if there are any questions that you have, please just click on that and follow the instructions and we'll try to read them out. Questions from the floor? We have uh, Dr. Ball. Uh, thank you, that was fantastic. I just want to reemphasize maybe two points that you touched on and skirted on. When you run a really busy pancreatic practice, particularly in adults, and I would say in Calgary specifically, we probably see once a month a patient that was managed years before in a conservative, non-operative way in the exact scenario as you're saying that is struggling, has been struggling for years with chronic pancreatitis. Yeah. At that point, we operate on them. So I fundamentally agree with you. I think the literature is really not overly helpful because it's all front-end biased. All these patients will go home conservatively managed and be okay for two months, six months, two years, six years. Almost always they come back to roost. I think we believe that firmly. The other thing I would caution against, and you showed some beautiful pictures of pancreatic gastrostomies. You also sh showed uh, hooking up that distal disconnected left pancreatic remnant. Mm -hmm. You know, we do that in elective pancreas surgery all the time in different scenarios, and you probably do as a pediatric uh, surgeon as well. But in general, propagating that, I think, in the literature and in, in reality is probably a dangerous thing, because you're asking a trauma surgeon on average, who doesn't operate on the pancreas, to deal with a bruised gland, a really small duct, a soft gland, and trying to do an operation they haven't done on a weekly basis. So I think probably, as you point out and as you emphasize, take it out and move forward, get them home, get them better, and get them on with life. Good job. Thank you. I, um, hopefully that, uh, the audience got to hear that because I can't summarize that. But basically what he said is everything I said was true. And, <laughs> and he agrees completely, um, the, uh, but he did caution that, uh, that not all uh, uh, trauma surgeons uh, can, can do pancreatic surgery. Um, uh, I, I think that that's sad. Uh, David Feliciano told me that, um, that if you're going to be a good trauma surgeon, you have to be a general surgeon. You have to operate every day. Yes, David, since... Dr. Lacey. Yes. <laughs> Since, uh, since the CT scan so poorly defines the pancreatic duct, and since that's so critical in the decision making, are you now routinely doing MRCPs or ERCPs, or how are you addressing that? So, um, so that's a great question. So do we, do, do we routinely image the duct? And the, the answer is, um, if the CT scan suggests that there is an, in, in, an injury, then we image them in one of those two ways. And we completely cheat. 
So those patients who we think that the duct is completely transected, we do an ERCP, and, um, and if, it's, if it shows that the duct is transected, we go immediately into the operating room. We actually do the ERCP in the operating room. If we don't think it is, then we get an MRCP, and if we're wrong, then we take them to the operating room and, and do it uh, you know, relatively shortly. But we use both modalities. It's a good question. Any other questions? Um, were there any from the audience? Uh, I don't. Let's see. Into your questions. It's in Spanish. Okay. Should you speak? Okay. Well, there's one question here, but I might need you there, Felipe. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it wasn't. It was an old question. Should still, you yeah. should you screen everyone for pancreatic injury, and if so, who should you be suspicious for? Um, that's a really tough question. So one of the things that we've learned is that not every patient who, who has a pancreatic injury has uh, an elevated lipase when they first come in. Uh, most of them will have an elevated lipase shortly thereafter, but, um, but no, we, um, we use CT scanning to identify those patients with injury, knowing that um, we're going to miss a small percentage of them. And if, we have, if they have tenderness or they aren't act, not acting right, then at that point we'll get a lipase, and at that point um, re-image them as necessary. Okay. All right, so now we know we can operate on all viscous injuries and the pancreas in case. And the pancreas. That's it. All right. All right. Thank you. <laughs>